Lord is very good. Yes, he is. And grateful to him for his love and his mercy, his grace. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Leviticus chapter 24, but we're going we're gonna to pray some more. We'll read verses 1 through 4. As you know, we're talking about the tabernacle. But our topic is about worship. In our awe and adoration, adoration of God. So if you'll go ahead and put the verses up, we'll read the verses. And then I, uh, I want to ask Bishop Clayton Endicott if he'd say a prayer for the word after we would read these verses. And the Lord said to Moses, command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light so that the lamps may be kept burning continually. Outside the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant, law in the tent of meeting. Aaron is to tend the lamps before the Lord from evening till morning continually. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. The lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord must be tended continually. Amen. We've been learning about the Ark of the, or the, the, well, we'll get to the Ark of the Covenant, but about the tabernacle. And we've been uh, learning at it, uh, learning about it from the process of what the priest would see as he would walk up to perform his, his, uh, his obligations before the Lord. Last week, we talked about how we are a royal priesthood. And so it is very fitting that we would see the tabernacle through the priest's eyes. And what was it that they would see? What was it? What was all of the the symbols? What did it mean to the priest as they were performing their obligations before the Lord? And then we learn as we go through this that the tabernacle is not some ancient relic, but it is a copy of the one that is in heaven. And it stands for Christ. It stands for God. It stands for his word. In so many ways, the tabernacle is very relevant to us today and our walk with the Lord and our worship. And so today, we're going to go inside the tabernacle in the holy place. And the very first thing that we would see when we would walk into the holy place would be the lamp the golden lamp stand. And if you would go ahead, I, I'm kind of throwing her some, some curve balls. I wanted to have a picture there. There we go. The golden lamp stand, many of us know it as the menorah. And I want to encourage you to continue to do your study in the tabernacle, dig up everything that you can. We could spend an entire year <laughs> on the lamp stand alone. There's so much so much we don't have the time to get into all of it today but this is a a a picture of the the lamp stand if you'll if you'll write this down exodus chapter 25 verse 31 through 40 it will give you some more description of what the lamp stand looked like it was very beautiful it was crafted out of gold gold speaks of god's holiness his righteousness his purity and on this lampstand would be decorated with almond blossoms. And, and to the, the, the nation of Israel, this signified resurrection. If you remember Aaron's rod and it, and it, it, was, it budded uh, into uh, almond blossoms, it speak to them of, of, of resurrection. And there would be six lamps on, uh, uh, in there and one in the middle, totaling seven. This is not a, a candlestick sometimes. It is translated in the Bible as candlesticks. This was, it burned oil, so it did not, it was not continuously burning on its own source of wax, that it had oil. 
as we learned, as we read in Leviticus chapter 24, it burned on oil that was pressed from olives. And as they walked into the holy place, it was completely dark. If you've ever used blackout curtains, you'll kind of know some of the darkness that, that the priest might have seen when he walked in there. There's no windows, so there's no natural light. And so the very first thing when you walked into the holy place that you would see was the light. It was the only source of light in this room. The significance of this lamp that speaks for us today might be explained a little bit more to us by Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 12, when he said, when Jesus spoke again to the people, and he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The priests, they could not go into, into this room and perform their duties if they did not have a light source. They would be tripping all over themselves. We'll get into the altar of incense. They could, not, they could not perform their duties there. They could not go to the table of showbread. They could not do what God required them to do if they did not have the lamp stand in there. It's only source of light. And for us today, I can't imagine trying to go through this life without the, the light of the world, without the only true source of light that we have, and that is Jesus. He brings the light of salvation to a sin-cursed world. He is the light of truth to the darkness of ignorance. He is the light of joy to the darkness of death. He is the light of life. And without that golden lampstand, the priests couldn't do their, their jobs. And without Jesus, we would be living the life of those from Proverbs chapter 4, verse 19, when it says, But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble without the light of the world we would be stumbling through this world with no hope. Kiddos, if you mind coming up here. We have a lot of uh, children in the nursery, but those who are here, I know there's a few of you. Come on. Come on up here. Come on, Kia. Conrad, I'm going to ask your help here. I need you guys to sit over here in the front. I need you to grab that in there. There's water here. It's going to stain the carpet, so we need to be careful not to spill it. You get that end right there. No, the table. The table. Grab the end of the table. And we're going to lift it up and slowly. Okay. All right, you guys can sit. Come on up here, Chandler. Just get in a place where you can see. I don't know if this water would stain the carpet, but I tried to stir it up with my finger and it stained my finger, so. <laughs> we talk about what Jesus does for us. What did Jesus do for you, Chandler? Yeah, he helped us. When you asked for forgiveness, he forgave you, right? In fact, Chandler, not too long ago, we got to go over and, and have a baptismal service and baptize Chandler as he, he made a declaration of faith before all of us that Jesus is his Lord. Conrad, he died on the cross for us. That's right. And anytime we, when we have sin in our heart and we need to go and ask God for forgiveness, the Bible says he will forgive us. How many times? Do you know? Infinity, I hope it's an infinity, right? Because that's how many times I mess up. No, the Bible says, yes, he is faithful and just to forgive us every time we mess up. Every time. Do you have a question? Do you have a thought? What? He died on the cross to save us. That's right. He absolutely did. Well, I want you to look at this, this plate here, this colored water. And it's going to kind of stand for our life. And this colored water here is the sin inside of our hearts. And when we need to get, take care of this sin in our hearts, we come to Jesus who we just read from John chapter 8, that he is the light of the world. 
and he is the light of the world. And when we ask Jesus to come into our life, he comes in and we ask him to forgive us for our sins. And Jesus, he forgives us, as you can see. And just takes the sin away. And he is the light of salvation. You see all that water go up in there? Isn't that neat? Yes. Let's read John chapter uh, 3, verse 16 and 17. Some of you may know 16 by heart, but we need to read verse 17 too. Let's read it together. Will you read it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And this is what Jesus came to the world. He came to seek and to save the lost. And when we don't have Jesus in our heart, we're lost. We're lost. And so we, we have Jesus in our heart who takes our sins away and he provides light into our life through his Holy Spirit and through his word. And I want you to remember, you don't forget everything. Yes, this was pretty neat that this water got, got up into the, in here. Science and physics is great, but let's not forget that one thing. Mm-hmm. Words are more powerful than words. Yes, they can be. And Jesus' words will never pass away. There are a lot of things that are going to go away. God's words will never go away. And when he says that when we ask for forgiveness, he'll forgive us, guess what? He'll forgive us. Let's pray. Father God, I just pray you will plant this seed into their hearts right now. You know, God, that the enemy is throwing a lot of lies into their hearts and their minds. The enemy wants them in, their, in our schools and everything they see on, on TV or they hear in music. We pray, dear God, that you will protect their hearts right now and let them know that when they mess up, they have a heavenly father they can turn to who, they, who will love them, who will, who will provide for them, who will care for them. When they get beat up, they can come to you, Lord. Please teach that to their hearts right now, we ask in your name. Amen. He is the light of salvation. You guys go back to your seats here. Uh, Everything will spill out, so go back to your seats. We need to remember that sometimes too, don't we? The enemy likes to come in the night and whisper into our ear and tell us you're no good. What I like to say back is, I know, I know I'm no good, but he is, (laughs) he is, he is the light. When you're in a dark room, how many times will we get familiar with our rooms, right? Sometimes I get so familiar with my room, I I hate to admit this, sometimes I got to get up in the night to do some things. And I will go through there thinking, I know where everything is at, except for I've forgotten where I put my boots right there and I trip right over them. And so the room is very familiar to me. And I'll get up and I'll try to walk through there on my own. And how many times do I still trip and stumble? We treat the Lord that way sometimes. It becomes familiar to us. I come to church for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, we do the same things. Sometimes we sing the same songs and it becomes familiar to us. And our worship to God becomes normal. Well, guess what? God is not ordinary. Normal worship is not enough. He is the only source of light. The only source of light. And if you don't have Jesus in your heart, you're tripling through the darkness. The priests were required to make sure the wicks were trimmed. As the wicks would burn, it would char, and the light would go dim. 
And so twice a day, we, we talked about what they had to do on the outside of the tabernacle every time they would go into the holy place. Twice a day, in the morning and night, they would go in and make sure that the, this candle, this, I said candlestick, but this lamp is filled with oil and that the wicks were trimmed. And there's a saying, we need to be trimmed and burning. They had a... The priest had a tool that would go in and, and pull the wicks up through the oil. And this was uh, something that they had to stay on top of every single day. It is, our, it is our job to make sure that we are continuously trimmed and burning, seeking the Lord, not allowing the enemy to, to, to let our wicks grow dim but we need to continually seek the Lord. And, and in Scripture, oftentimes the oil refers to the Holy Spirit. And we understand that the, the, this, this lamp did not burn on its own source of, of energy, that it needed to be replenished by the oil. We need to have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We cannot pursue God on our own. We learned that in the Garden of Eden. We learned that when, when Cain decided to bring his own worship to the Lord. We must approach the Lord the way he tells us to. We need the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I had a song stuck in my mind. We'll get to it here in a second. I'm just giving you a little warning. It'll be stuck in your mind for the rest of the week too. But since we are a royal priesthood, and since Jesus is the light of the world, and since we've learned that I have Jesus in me, Jesus has something to say to you today in Matthew chapter 5, which I don't have, so I have my Bible. Chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. We need to understand and we, we pray to the Lord, oh God, I wish you would just tell me who I am and what I am. Listen to him as he tells you. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to you, Father, who is in heaven. It is not our light, it is the Lord's light, and we need to let his light shine so that others can see his love and his good works in you. A city on a hill with its lights can be seen from miles around. Just as that lampstand, when we walked into the holy place, was the only source of light, it is unmistakable. There is no guessing where is the lampstand coming from. There's no guessing where the light source is coming from. It is immediate. It pierces the dark. There is no other source of light. So it is true Christ in our life. And the oil is a constant representation of the Holy Spirit. In Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, we wonder how, how, how can I truly worship the Lord in a way that he deserves? How can I walk in this life in a way that, that God has called me to, to pursue him with all of my heart? I can't do it. He tells us in Zechariah 4 and 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts. Are you guys ready to sing this song? It would, be, it would have been a whole lot better for Jeff and Anita to lead you in this song, but I'm going to give it a shot. If you remember, not by my, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, not by my, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, this mountain shall be removed, this mountain shall be removed, this mountain shall be removed. By my spirit, saith the Lord. 
Now, I pray that song is stuck in your head for the rest of the week. There could be worse songs stuck in there, right? <laughs> it's the power of the Holy Spirit. In your life, your best. My dad always told me this when he was trying to encourage me to be a good employee. And, you know, uh, your best ability is your availability. That's your best ability. And to the Lord, I have nothing to offer him but brokenness. I have nothing to offer him but messes. I have nothing to offer him but the best ability to make the mess out of everything. But the best ability is your availability. To make yourself available to the Lord every morning. You say, here, I got this plan, right? We say, Lord willing, I'm going to get through this day. But God, I got this plan. You have permission to mess it up according to however you want, whenever you want. Because I'm not going to get through this day on my own might, on my own power, but by his spirit. God's word is also described many times in the Bible as a light, as a lamp. We know in Psalm 119, that entire chapter, right? That's the biggest chapter. The entire chapter is about God's word. If you'll go and read that. But let's read verse 105. And we know this one well. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. I got the pleasure through a connection with my sister, um, um, uh, at Mission Trail Junior High School here on Tuesdays. They have the fellowship of Christian athletes that, that meet together. And I got to go and make a little presentation to these middle schoolers. It was wonderful to be able to say the name of Jesus in the school. That, that was incredible. They had over 80 some kids come to this. I, I came prepared for like 30. <laughs> and so and when they kept pouring, pour, pouring in, I told my sister, you better go make more copies. I only have 30 here. But I was telling them, and it was about God's word, and I was start trying to tell myself, if, if I don't ever get to see these kids again, if there's one thing I want to tell them, and they know Jesus. Of course, we talked about Jesus. You need to have Jesus in your life. We talked about his word. We talked about how it is a light unto our path. And I asked them, if anybody asks me what my opinions are, I go to the word. That's where my opinions are. I know we live in a climate today where we like to share our opinions. But I got to tell you, my opinions come from God's word. And my direction and my life, it comes from God's word. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His word will never pass away. Oh, I wish we had more time. The other items in the holy place, there were three items in the holy place when you went in there. We have the lamp. And again, we could spend a year on that. And we could spend a year on the altar of incense. We read in, in Revelations 5 and 8 and 8, 3 through 4, we've talked about this. This is, a, this is a place that signified the prayers before God. They weren't allowed to burn grain offerings on there or drink offerings on there. Once a year before the, the, whole, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, they would sprinkle blood on this altar of incense, but just fragrance incense is burned on this. They would take the coals from the altar and the outside where they were doing all of the sacrifices because to go and worship God, to go into God's presence, sin must be dealt with. They would take those coals and they would go into the altar of incense and they would burn this fragrance incense and the smoke would rise up and that signified prayers before God. It is impossible to have a low assessment of prayer when we understand the significant roles it plays in heaven. Psalm 141, verses 1 through 2. I call to you, Lord. Come quickly to me. Hear me when I call you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. I think it's fitting that 
the light of the word and the altar of incense are in there because our prayers and the word should go hand in hand. They're handcuffed together. Remember when we were talking about what does it mean to pray in faith? Praying in faith means laying hold of the promises that God has revealed in his word. And if we don't know those promises, how can we pray them? And then we have the table of uh, showbread. Twelve loaves of bread, and we're not really given the dimensions of how big they were. A lot of people have their own, their own thoughts about how big they were, and that's, and that's fine. But there were 12 loaves of bread signifying the 12 tribes of Israel. And most people believe that there were six on one side, six on the other. It speaks of God's sustenance and satisfaction of his people. Something else that we also need to understand, that a table set with food in the context of worship meant fellowship and community. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. We've been doing this study on Wednesdays. And Jesus gave the offer to this church when he says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. What greater gift, what greater blessing we can have than communion and fellowship with our Lord and Savior Jesus. There's a whole list of things we would like to have in our lives, right? There's a whole list of things we want to see in our country. And I know this week is going to be a bumpy one. But there's no greater blessing than to be in the presence of God Almighty. All of that stuff melts away. All of the worry, all of the, you know, it, it just we carry it around like a backpack. And when we go into the presence of God, it vanishes. Because when we're in his presence, what is greater? What is better? What is more profitable? Worship is a word that describes a person's walk and relationship with God. A relationship that respects God's holiness, majesty, and worth. That's worship. It's more than just our song set on Sunday morning. It's what we're going to do tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's not just a Sunday thing. Our lamps must be trimmed and burning. The priest had to go in twice a day. The table of showbread also reminds us of Jesus' name that we learned. I don't know if you remember, Art, Artos Zoes. In John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Jeff and the media, if you want to come and get ready. If you're hungry for the Lord, you don't have to be anymore. If you don't understand some of these things, that's okay. You can come and ask him. And we can go on this journey together. As I told you, we could, we could spend years on what we just spent 30 minutes on. But the Lord is giving us an example here in the tabernacle of what our lives must be. And we must deal with sin, not ignore it. We must continually wash ourselves in his word. We must continually seek the light. That's our focus. We must... Show that light. And we can't do that on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. We need God. 
There are so many people out there who don't know. They're stumbling in the dark. They don't know what they don't know. And it may be you this week. God uses to show them the light. If you will, bow your heads. Hopefully you've been able to see the tabernacle, not not just as some old relic, but it's packed with applications for our walk and our worship with the Lord. I want to just ask right now that you would just listen to the Holy Spirit into your heart, into your mind. Maybe there's some things you need to deal with, some things you didn't even know that were there before. Maybe you're hungry for more. Whatever, whatever the Spirit is putting on your heart right now, I want to ask that you be obedient. Step out in faith. Come to the altar. Go. If someone's, the Spirit's telling you to go speak with someone, go. Be obedient to the Lord. But the altars are open. If you want to come, please come. Let's pray. missionary named A.W. Milne. He set sail for the New Hebrides in, in the South Pacific, knowing full well that the headhunters who lived there had martyred every missionary before him. Milne did not fear for his life because he had already died to himself. For 35 years, he lived among that tribe and loved them. When he died, tribe members buried him in the middle of their village and inscribed this epitaph on his tombstone. When he came, there was no light. When he left, there is no darkness. Let it be said of us, the people who we even bump into in the grocery store. So we have the light of the world inside of us. And don't tell me he can't affect someone's life in just a bump. Yes, he can. Do you believe that today? Jeff, would you say a prayer for us? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for our time here today with you. Thank you for challenging words. Help us to be available for you, God. Whatever our situation, Lord, use us. Help us to be available to do your work. However humble, however simple or however you want it, God. We love you. We give you all the praise. Help us to show your love. Help us to show your friendly. Help us just to be friendly to others that maybe don't deserve it, God. Give us patience. Give us peace, God. Help us to love others. In your name, amen. Amen, amen. We have uh, a couple of special visitors here today. I'm going to ask you to share a word with us after our uh, announcements just to give you a few times to think about that. I hate it when people just put me on the spot, although I'm sure you're a pro at it. So we have Bishop, Bishop Clayton in the cot and his lovely wife, Sister Wanda, here today. But uh, real quickly, we'll get through some of our uh, announcements. Tomorrow, we have an open sanctuary for prayer. It's come and go. If you want to come and, and pray with a group of us, you can come and join us. Or if you just want to come and pray for your family or the community, or you want to pray for uh, this country, please come. The church will be open from 6 to 7. Come and go. It's open for prayer. This Wednesday is our Operation Christmas uh, Child Shoebox Packing Party. Thank you so much for all of the things that you have, have we've been collecting the past several months. And boy, we're going to have a record year this year. We have so much stuff. I don't know if Crystal and Wes can get through their office very well with all the stuff we've been packing in there. So we have pizza will be provided. If you want to come and help them, they'd be happy to have you uh, uh, join them in, in the packing party. Is there anything else I need to mention, Crystal, Savannah? Nope. All right. Good. I got it all. Uh, mark your calendars, December 7th. Our 55-plus Christmas banquet this year. We have a sign-up sheet out there in the lobby. If you would please uh, be so kind as to sign up so we can plan accordingly. And, you know, Beverly's got a good meal she's making for everybody. So if you think you can be here that day, please go sign up in the, in the lobby. And then we are doing our winter care package uh, this year. 
uh, December 21st is when we are going to uh, deliver those packages. But items that we need your help to collect are also listed in the lobby if you're wondering what to, what to get when you're at the store. We would really appreciate your help in all of that. And with all, uh, with all that said, we ask Mr. Clayton if you would share a word with us or uh, greet, the, greet the congregation. Wherever you would like, yes. Maybe look up there. <laughs> And what a wonderful word. I was deeply blessed with the worship today. Thank you, Jeff and Van. For, it was a powerful time to be with the Lord today. He was wonderful. I just share a word uh, from the scripture quickly from uh, Revelations 12. Uh, I like to look at the things we've done in our tradition and ask why. And one of the things of my tradition was the testimony. The Pentecostal church often on Sunday night took time to testify one of my theologian friends said it was the most dangerous 20 minutes of the week because <laughs> you had no idea what somebody would say. Maybe because of that danger, we've walked away from testimony. But the word of your testimony is powerful. It is a liturgy, a worship. It's a moment of a gift of God to share what he's done in your life. Here's what the scripture says about your testimony. Revelations 12 verse 11 says, when John looked into the heavens and he saw some wearing white robes and they were worthy to be with him, he said, they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives unto death. I share today a word just of testimony from brothers and sisters in Ukraine. I had the joy uh, a little over two and a half weeks ago to stand in Ukraine and to teach there our pastors and leaders, nearly all of them in the 24 churches. I think every one of them could leave the country if they want. But they do not love their lives, even unto death. They have a calling to serve the Lord in that country. The churches are growing. They're baptizing, sometimes in barrels, typically in water that's very old because the running water is not, not common. Potable water we deliver from two vans that people like you from Church of God of Prophecy donated money for, and we bought vans for them, and they drive around and give each other drinkable water. By people like yourselves in this church, we're able to deliver a little over 60 um, uh, machines. You run by gas. What do you call that in English? to make power, generate, generators, over 60 generators to our churches and leaders. There's no electricity multiple hours in the day. But on Sunday, we have praise and worship with guitar and drum and electric piano, and there's lights in the house of God. And they love their lives, not even unto death. We've had missiles drop right in front of our church house. I have a picture of one standing directly in front of the church house that just somehow did not go off. Several sisters met together to shop just a little bit in a downtown area, a small town. They went to shop just a little bit and get some of the fresh fruit that would have brought, been brought in. They have many times not all the products that are normal. And as they were there, a drone swept down into the township, and they knew what was coming, and people began to fall on the ground. And just as they fell on the ground, the birds raised up and moved that drone out into the field, and it exploded in the field and not in the city. <laughs> And we have testimony after testimony after testimony of God taking care of his people. In all of the war, we've lost one pastor. We have one pastor who's in prison, another who's lost. We don't know where he's at because they uh, brought him into the military. But again and again, people come to Jesus. One of our local churches is more than five times its normal size. They've started four Bible schools for new believers, for leadership, and so on. It's an amazing time for the work of God. I asked them if they'd like to join together. I haven't been in two and a half years. We met in the mountains, a beautiful area, the Kapachan Mountains. It's a big mountain uh, a range that goes all the way from um, Ukraine, Belarus, Romania, all the way to the Black Sea. And that's one small area that all of Ukraine is not being destroyed. And so people like you gave to bring them into this uh, area of their own nation, the mountains. I was able, by God's grace, with a pastor from Czech Republic, 
a, a bishop from Czech Republic and a pastor from Poland to fly into Krakow and we drove about six hours inland and there we met each day to teach and train pastors and then we gave them three more days of vacation. Some of them had not slept in weeks. It was so silent they would wake up at night and meet together and pray because every night they heard hundreds of sirens. Many of them sleep in shifts. They go to uh, watch the men, the apartment, the wives will meet in the big high rises. They will sleep downstairs about three hours in a shift and then come upstairs and the husbands go down and the wives stay upstairs and wash the apartment. They sleep in shifts night after night and they were telling me it's the first time in weeks, months, maybe over a year that we've been able to sleep through the night. It was an amazing vacation for them just to be together and be in God's word and worship. I want to thank you and people like you all over the world who have given deeply from your hearts. It's not that many of us in our churches are highly wealthy. God has taken care of us. None of us are starving. We were all able to buy flannels for today. God is good to us. But I also know that life is not easy and that you work hard for your money. And many of you are on very limited incomes and you are the ones who support the ministry of this church again and again. Not the wealthy, <laughs> but the loving. And I just want to tell you how much I love you, and I thank you for that. One last testimony, maybe from Israel. We have a small church in Israel. They sit uh, just at the border of Lebanon. I can stand at the leader of the church's balcony and look into the trees of Lebanon. He's in Jish, just above Tel Aviv, about two hours' drive. In that small village, we have one congregation. It's basically a, a congregation of uh, Palestinian Christians and a lovely group, small group. And they've been praying for leadership. The man who leads the church, Brother Jewel, says, I'm not the pastor. Please don't call me pastor. I'm just a leader. I don't have a calling to pastor, but someone's got to lead. And so they meet in their small prayer meeting with just a few families and pray. And one of their greatest prayers has been over the years, God, send us a pastor. God, send us leadership. Send workers into your field. One of the old men there, a Bedouin from his heritage, would sit in the village uh, uh, next to the Jish, and when the children would kick the soccer ball towards him, he'd kick it back. And when they would run by, he would stroke their hair. And when they would laugh, he would laugh with them. He only has a few teeth, a wonderful brother in the Lord. He loves Jesus with all of his heart. One of the young men was very touched by this Bedouin brother. And every time he would come by, the brother would talk to him. And more and more, the boy would ask, why are you always so happy? The boy was Islamic and raised in a strong Islamic family. Uh, Avi is his name. And as a young boy, again and again, this old man would just show him God's love. And when he turned 18, he came to our brother in the church, Avi did, and he said, Sir, what is the reason for your joy? I wish I could say it in Arabic. I cannot. And the brother said, I have the joy of Jesus in my life and he gave his testimony. Avi gave his life to Jesus. He attends our church there locally. He was arranged to marry a young woman who is Islamic, but he prayed and prayed that she would receive Jesus before they married. She received Jesus. She's a school teacher. He's about 6'6 six, six and about 6'9. He's a huge boxer and he trains boxers and athletes and he's a huge guy. He's, he's scary. If, if if you weren't going to get saved in church, if you saw him, you'd say, please don't hurt me. I'll get saved. Yeah. <laughs> He's this huge, huge guy, Avi. And so Avi, over a period of time, when I met him in a youth conference in, uh, in Prague, every uh, two years we do a large youth conference, about 400 young people from around 30 nations. We hold the whole conference in 11 languages. And Avi was there. He speaks English. He speaks Arabic. He speaks Hebrew. Uh, he speaks German, actually. And so I met him at this conference, and he came to me and he said, Bishop Clayton, I've been wanting to meet you. Tell me, where can I study the Bible? God has called me to preach. Our little church in Jish is a small church. They named themselves the Little Flock. But the Little Flock has prayed again and again the prayer of the Lord Jesus that he send forth laborers. Avi and his wife, and now the leader of the church's son, have decided next year they're going to come to Germany to study three years at the Bible Seminary, where I'm on the, uh, the board from the Church of God. They're going to study there and go back to Israel. One will pastor in Jish, and the son wants to plant a church in Jordan. Your prayers, your prayers 
touch people's lives like this. It's a testimony of their lives that I share with you. Hmm, Pastor, we need to go back to 20 minutes of danger and testify again. We are lifted up by the word of the Lord as it speaks to others. If we would stand with him in white robes, it'll be through the blood of Jesus and the word of our testimony. Amen. Amen. The Lord is so good. Be mindful of this testimony this week. You may come across the next Avi. Share your testimony. Take that light of Jesus that is inside of you and go share it with someone this week. You're dismissed.